And we also want to say to you that if you are here for the very first time um, or you are watching our YouTube channel for the first time and you do not have a home church, then we want to say to you, welcome home. All right. Let me ask, uh, so we're, like I said, we're continue our, continuing our series, Tales of the Kingdom. Let me ask, does anyone know what an influencer is? Have you ever heard of the term influencer? If you're on social media, we live in an exciting time in history when the buying decisions of many of us are being reshaped by a very small but incredibly powerful group of people called influencers. Most of these influencers are basically social media wizards, some good, some bad, who have been able to shift the global buying patterns of millions of people with a single post. This is what they're using, this is what they're wearing, this is what they're watching, and then the rest of us just have to follow along because this influencer I'm following is doing it. Because God forbid we get left behind of anything that they're doing. Whether it's the best coffee, before an intense work day, the new diet fad, because they lost 30 pounds in 30 days, the healthiest dog food, the hottest destination uh, for vacations, the $600 pair of shoes that looks like they worked in a dairy for three years, the latest fitness trends for people over 70. I know that's no one in here. You know, they have this mentality of, I quit my job and now I make $20,000 a month to get you to want to be me. That's basically what an influencer is. And it's so funny to me how they promote themselves as being an expert in a very certain field. And the crazy part is none of us are asking the question, what makes you an expert? What makes you an expert in that field? Because we live in this culture that's dominated by self-promotion, don't we? And if we're not careful, this mindset can actually seep into our spiritual lives, which can kind of, kind of lead us to believe that we can earn God's favor, that we can earn God's um, um, uh, permission, or that we can uh, uh, earn, earn his, 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 his smile down upon us because of some action that we do, because of some comparison that we've made with others. So today we're going to look at a story about the type of life that really gets God's attention. Okay, if you have a, a copy of God's Word, turn to Luke chapter 18 today. We were just in Luke 18 about three weeks ago uh, in the first eight verses, but we're going to be skipping down from verses 9 to 14 today. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 18. The first two parables in chapter 18 teach us about prayer. Like we said, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Jesus is talking about what happens to the person who has a life of persistent prayer, who has something that they've been praying about and they never give up on, and, that, and kind of how God brings justice to those who are in need. And then Jesus shifts his attention in the same chapter from being a person of persistent prayer to about where our attitude in our prayer is. And it's really our attitude in our prayer that impacts God's response to us. And so we're going to learn about these examples in the parable in verses 9 through 14. It says this, to some who were confident, this is Jesus talking, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. First of all, Jesus knows his audience. He knows who's listening. And so he says, to those who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, he told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector knowing that this guy can hear his prayer. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But then the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
Jesus continues to talk. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Will you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you are going to be teaching us today. I pray, Father, that you will speak your words to your servant, to your people. Amen. So Jesus tells the story of two very different men and how they choose to approach God in prayer. So the first man would have been easily recognized and even admired by the people listening to the story that Jesus was telling because he was a Pharisee. Some of the most respected religious leaders of the time, men who had dedicated their lives to serving God. I mean, they knew the scriptures like no one else. And they were respected for not only their their knowledge, but their strict adherence to following hundreds of religious laws, most of which they made up themselves to prove their loyalty and their reverence for God. So the audience that was there that day listening to Jesus tell the story would have assumed that of the two men that Jesus just mentioned, that the Pharisee would have been the one that Jesus admired. Remember, each of Jesus' parables had a target audience and a target lesson. And like we said, a parable is a lesson to teach or to illustrate a spiritual lesson. And Jesus was a master storyteller. And he gives us the purpose behind telling this particular story in the very first verse, verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. So in other words, if you're here right now listening to me, this is Jesus talking, and you have so much confidence in your own self-righteousness and you look down on everyone else, listen up because I've got a story to tell you. It's funny how human behavior hasn't changed in thousands of years. It's been over 2,000 years since Jesus walked on this earth with humanity and still today we struggle with self-promotion in our comparison with others. It was happening then and it's happening now. I mean, look at what this Pharisee listed of all the good things he said. This is all the things that I do that makes me worthy, that makes me holy of God's favor. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and even this tax collector. I fast twice a week and even give a tenth of all that I get. He's setting up, he's basically declaring out loud his resume for why he's holy and why he gets God's favor. Even though this Pharisee knew the Bible, he kept all the religious laws and all the religious customs, he did everything right. He had forgotten the most important truth, which is this. You and I cannot earn God's favor. We can't. We cannot earn God's mercy. We cannot earn God's grace. We cannot earn God's forgiveness. So many people in our world believe that they can earn their way to heaven simply by the way that they live, how many bad things they stay away from, how good their lives look compared to that person. Well, at least I'm not as bad as him. At least I'm not as bad as that group of people or her. And when we interact with God, we can feel like we somehow deserve God's favor because we're better than who we're comparing ourselves to. And then all of a sudden we start to build up kind of this internal dialogue of why we deserve God's favor and they don't. These are all the things that I do to stay holy, but I know that they aren't doing these things. These are the things that I know that I'm doing to earn God's favor ahead of this person ahead of this family member, ahead of this coworker, ahead of this group of people. The Pharisee picked four groups of people, four very specific groups of people that he compared himself to. And to him, they were the worst. That's why he actually said them out loud. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, and tax collectors. He made sure that he threw in tax collectors because he knew the tax collector could hear him. So it makes me think, 
Who makes your list? Who's on my list? I mean, come on. We all have a mental list of people who don't stack up against us. Sometimes it's just as simple as that stupid driver that cut in front of you in the Starbucks line this morning. At least you're not as bad as that person, right? Because they got their caramel macchiato, everything else, you know, eight, eight minutes before you did. But sometimes it's generational. Well, at least we're not as bad as the boomers. Or at least we're not as bad as the millennials. The millennials are running this place. You know, at least we're not as bad as Gen Zers when we all know that Gen X is actually the best, right? Okay, I'll, I'll get off that. Okay. Well, let's make it a little more personal. Well, at least we're not as bad as the Republicans. At least we're not like all those Democrats. Maybe for you, it's a, it's a color of your skin thing. Maybe it's a socioeconomic. At least I'm not like the poor people. At least, you know, at least I'm middle class and I don't have it as bad as... Or maybe it's a body shape. Maybe it's a parenting style. Maybe it's all those single people. It's all those married people. We've subconsciously built a mental list and maybe not even, or maybe not even aware of it because it's in those dark moments of the soul that we can struggle not to believe that we're better than someone else. And this is exactly what we see in the Pharisee in this story. And the logical next step is because, because I'm better than that group of people or that person, I deserve or can earn God's favor. And you see, church, this way of thinking builds and feeds a false cultural narrative to believe that my goodness can earn God's favor. And then Jesus went on to add a few more details to the story. The Pharisee lists two things that he does on a regular basis, two actions that he takes that are supposed to illustrate and let everybody know that this, these, are, these things actually complement on why I'm holier than you. I'm, why I'm such a good guy. He brags about his generosity, tithing 10% of everything that he gets, and also fasting, which is a spiritual discipline of abstaining from food. Not just once a year, but twice a week. You see, there's this need that this Pharisee has to continue to vocalize that there's a level of holiness that he's achieved that no one else has. That the common person hasn't reached his level of holiness because of this checklist of things that he's done. Sometimes, church, we can catch ourselves doing the right thing for the wrong reason. The right thing for the wrong reason. Our good deeds, our generosity, our fasting, all of these things that we're supposed to be doing is supposed to be an outgrowth of love for God and a gratitude for what he has done for us. And this is a great gut check for all of us today. Am I doing the right thing for the right reason? Or have I shifted my focus to impress others? Have I shifted my focus to gain approval? Have I shifted my focus to gain someone's friendship? Let's be people who do the right thing the right way for the right reason. So that God's smile on us, that his approval, that's what should motivate us every single day. Not the approval or the attention of people, but the approval and the attention of our Heavenly Father. So how do we overcome this? If that's where we are today, then how do we overcome this? How do we overcome this, this mentality of self-promotion or comparison with others, this, this mindset the scripture is clear that none of us, that none of us are better than anyone else. That none of us are of greater value to God than your neighbor. None of us. The way we see people like Jesus sees people is by embracing the two greatest commandments. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. Love God, 
love people, the two greatest commandments. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. When we commit to loving God and spending that regular time in his word and in prayer, we suddenly become more aware of our own brokenness. We suddenly become more aware, more self-aware of our need for Jesus. As we study the scriptures, we begin to embrace rather than reject the unique and creative design of God in our lives that makes all of us different. All of our different skills, all of our different abilities, all of our different talents. Listen to me when I say this, just because people don't think like you or just because people don't act like you does not make them less significant or have less value in this world. Let me say that again. Just because people don't think like you or act like you does not make them less significant or have less value in this world. Are people going to do things and say things to really tick you off? Yep. Are they going to do a mockery of the Last Supper at the Olympics and get all the Christians up in arms? Yep. That's nothing new. They've been doing it for two thousand years and they will continue to do it. But God says, I will not be mocked. We don't have to fight God's battles. God can fight his own battles. You know what Jesus said? Pray for your enemies. When I saw that, it didn't make me mad. It made me sad. And Jesus said to pray for your enemies, to pray for those who mock Christ. We were not being persecuted. They were mocking Jesus. And guess what? We sit back and we pray for them. My dad said something to me a long time ago when I was a little kid. He said, son, never get upset and never be surprised when sinners act like sinners. That's what they're supposed to do. Your job is to pray for them. Whether or not you want to turn the Olympics off, that's up to you. I love the swimming and the gymnastics, so I'll be watching. All right. But as you grow in love towards God, it will spill over into your life because you will be more loving and grace-filled to those around you. If you want to overcome pride, if you want to overcome arrogance in your life, then your focus needs to be on getting to know and getting closer to Jesus. The result will be a life that is selfless, and less self-centered. So that's the first guy. That's the Pharisee. Now let's turn our attention to the second man in this story. The crowd listening to Jesus that day would have also then known this person very well also. Tax collectors were some of the most hated people in that culture. They were Jews who worked for the Roman government and they earned their money by cheating and robbing their own people. So that's why the Jewish people hated the tax collectors so much. They're like, you're one of us and you're robbing us for the Roman government. Rome told the tax collectors just how much they were supposed to get from each community. And the way the tax collectors made their salary was they would add their wages on top of what they were requiring from the community. And so this led many tax collectors to demand extra payments from people who were already struggling in order to get rich themselves. So the crowd listening to Jesus that day would have expected Jesus to condemn this tax collector, just like he did the Pharisee. But Jesus describes this man's posture before God very differently to that of the Pharisee. Look at verse 13 again. But the tax collector stood at the distance. He would not even come, he would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I imagine some people there listening that day probably thought there's no way that God will or could forgive this man. Look at all the families he's destroyed. Look at all the lives he's destroyed. Look at, look at the families he's probably divided up in the homes that he's caused havoc to because he basically just took so much from them. 
This man is outside of God's forgiveness, is what they probably thought. This man is outside of God's grace. The scripture says that he stood at a distance. The shame, the shame that he felt would not even let him approach God in prayer. His posture, his actions, everything about him demonstrated the emotional and spiritual agony of what was going on on the inside of him. Have you ever experienced that type of struggle? Have you ever experienced that much emotional anguish in your life? Maybe you let someone down again in what felt like your last chance to redeem a relationship. Maybe you've fallen back into some type of habitual sin or some sort of addiction after having been clean for so long and the shame is just overwhelming. Maybe you're here today and you wonder if in fact you have strayed too far from God to ever be forgiven again. Let me just encourage you today that because of Jesus, there is hope. We put so much stress on ourselves when the whole time Jesus is saying, no, you can't do anything because Jesus already did it all. He paid the price on the cross. Our job is to accept that and to try our best to keep that restorative relationship with him. So in a wild twi- twist of the story that would have caught, every, that would have caught everybody off guard in the audience. Jesus chose the good guy, bad guy scenario in the story, and it's not who everyone thought. Look in verse 14 again. I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, Pharisee, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exhausted. Here's the single thought that I want us all to process through this week. A lot of times we have three or four fill-ins, not today, we have one. A single thought. The big idea is this, God responds to my pride with truth, but my humility with grace. God responds to my pride with truth, but my humility with grace. All through the pages of scripture, we see that the value system of heaven is based on humility and availability. Humility and availability. Not on our perfection, (laughs) because that will never happen. So this should actually be really encouraging for all of us. That what God is looking for is not a bunch of faultless rituals that we just continue to cycle through over and over and over again, because we think that's what earns our relationship with God. It's not. It's not our perfect devotionals. It's not our schedules. It's not our prayer schedules. It's not making sure that we're here 52 weeks out of the year for perfect attendance because you don't get an award here at New Life for being here every week. No, what God is seeking is men and women who have a humble heart. Men and women who acknowledge their desperation for him men and women who acknowledge their need for him, men and women who live dependent on Jesus throughout the moments of life. So what what does this type of humble, kind of dependent living look like for us and how do we get there in our our lives? There's actually two passages of, of scripture that I wanna point out to you you can write them down. They're in your, they're, I think they're in your notes as well. And I want you to meditate on these this week. They're short passages, but they're great, great passages to commit to memory. The first one is Proverbs 16, 18. It says, pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. That's one side of it. That's the prayer of the Pharisee. Remember, two men approached the temple. The prayer of the Pharisee was basically Proverbs 16, 18. 
Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And then comes the tax collector who's repentant and humble. We see in James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. You never have to worry about self-promotion. If you are always approaching God with a humble spirit, God will promote you. God will lift you up. God will exalt you. Built into this fabric of our faith is a series of spiritual practices that we, we, we talk about them often around here called spiritual disciplines. And one of those disciplines involves kind of reading and reflecting on, on, on a passage or maybe a, a group of passages of Scripture. And then after you read through those, read them through several times, kind of ask God to point out the truth of those Scriptures. Every day, just read a group of Scriptures and say, now God, show me the truth. What do you want me to see in here? What do you want me to, to kind of learn and digest? And to, what do you want to really attach to my spirit in these scriptures? It's something I do on a consistent basis. Lord, what do you want me to see? What do you want me to hear? What do you want me to feel as I read this? Here's my challenge to all of us this week. Go home and I want you to reflect, maybe even reread this passage Luke 18, 9 through 14. And then here's what I want you to do beyond that. I want you to ask yourself, Lord, what are some blind spots in my pride that I can't see? Which one of these, which one of these prayers do I subconsciously and unintentionally pray the most often? Do I have the prayer of the Pharisee where I'm always thanking you that I'm not like them? Or am I coming to you with a humble and broken heart, acknowledging that you are my God, that you are the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, that I am your creation, that I am your vessel, that I am your instrument, that I am your conduit to make sure that other people know who you are through me. It's not about what I've done. It's about who he is. And ask God to say, God, if there are any areas of pride in my life, reveal those to me so that I can lay it here between you and I and just walk away from it. I don't want to be like the Pharisee to where I see less value in others. But instead, show me those areas of my pride so that I can lift those people up so that I can pray for them. That I can come to you with a humble spirit. It's my challenge for all of us this week. Reread those. Read those two passages there at the end about what it means to be prideful, what it means to be humble. Ask God to show you any areas of pride that you're dealing with and then lay it at God's feet and walk away. Will you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, thank you Thank you for the lesson that we all heard this morning. Thank you for what it did for me personally. Thank you for showing me the areas of pride in my life. I see things on TV that kind of bends me a certain way. And Lord, to know, when I hear, th hear people talk and hear conversations, see things on social media, Lord, to be able to step back from all of that and then to read Scripture to see what my response should be towards that. A holy discontent to see people coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. To want people to know who you are. Instead of casting judgment, Lord, I, I pray for those. That you will break them as well. That you will break them and humble them like you did me 34 years ago. And showed me my own pride, my own arrogance. And brought me to a place of repentance. Lord, I pray that for all of those who persecute you and your people. Father, let us not be a people that pray a pharisaical prayer. But instead, the prayer of a humble tax collector that sees himself as a sinner. And humbly comes to you, Lord, broken, asking for change in his life. Let us be those kind of people. 
Lord, we bless you today. We thank you. Thank you for setting the example for us, Jesus, for how to respond. Thank you for setting the example for us, Jesus, in your parables of how to pray and what attitude to have in our prayer. And that's the attitude we chase, one of humbleness. We love you. We are surrendered to you. We are surrendered to your way. We are surrendered to your kingdom, not ours. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, thanks for checking in with us today. We hope that the message was inspiring and encouraging for you to take at least one step closer to Jesus. Hey, if you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, go ahead and do that. That way you can keep up with what's happening around here at New Life. You can also check out our website at newlifecc.com. If you ever want us to pray with you or you want to support what's happening here at New Life, you can do that on our website as well. Again, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.